Okay, so there it is. What do you see? Can you see that? It's kind of hard. So there's like a, there's the sun, I think Saturn, there's a galaxy off in the distance. I think that's the Earth, but it looks a little too close to the sun for my comfort. So I would put it maybe back here. Then another galaxy, a meteor. So that's typically what we think of when we think of heaven and Earth, literally, okay? So then there's that. So is it that when the Bible says heaven and Earth or the Mosaic Covenant? Can everybody, everybody see that icon? Okay, great. All right, so here's the question. I know, I know, trust me. The first time someone said this to me in 1993, I was like, are you off your rocker? Oh, wait, sorry, I just used a metaphor, <laughs> right? But really, I was like, dude, you're crazy. That's another one. I knew the dude was not crazy, but we say it all the time. I mean, holy cow, you know, when Linda calls me up and gives me some of her awesome ideas, I say, are you insane? There's not... <laughs> no, she's got great ideas. I, I really love it, you know. Now, Lord knows the metaphors Austin uses for me, <laughs> his daddy. So when I asked the question, did heaven and earth pass away? It seems out of this world. I know. I, it, it, trust me. By the end of tonight, we are going to exhaust every metaphor known to humankind. All right. Let's see what the Bible says. How many of us would agree with these words? In the first chapter of John, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Everybody agree? Anyone think we're still under the law of Moses or want to be? It's no fun because you get put to death. That's never fun, right? Like if you, if in, in the old covenant, 2,000 years ago and before, if you broke the Sabbath, like you did work on the Sabbath, you had to be put to death. And that was a drag, you know, because then you can't have fun the next day. We all agree it's taken place. Grace and truth have come. We're not under the Old Testament. That's why it's called old. It's done away with. We're in a new testament, a new promise. In fact, the Bible indicates that God has given us a ring and he's placed it on our finger and we're the bride. He calls us his church. He's married to us. Think about it. We're married. That's a perfect metaphor. We're married to Christ. We're called, the church is called his wife. It's a beautiful metaphor, and it represents our intimate relationship with the one who loved us and gave himself for us. So we, we agree, hopefully, that this is fulfilled. <clears throat> Restated by the Apostle Paul, who was under the Old Testament at one time, he says, for sin will not have dominion over you. And you think, well, man, I sure sometimes feel like it. Keep going back to that Percocet, doggone it. Or keep going, you know, which, by the way, I thank God for your ministry, Rick. I really do. As a recovering drug addict, opiates, I thank God for it. I really do. And I'm sorry for all the stuff that they required, you know, that I knew was essential, but you just have to know how much I appreciate that as someone who is actually in recovery. And I always tell people again, I always will be, okay? So thank you for what you're doing, all right? But that's not what this is talking about. This is not talking about drug addiction. This is not talking about alcoholism, not talking about pornography addiction or sex addiction. This is talking about a status where Jesus said this, if you commit sin, you are the slave of sin. Just one sin. But then he doesn't stop there. He gives us the greatest news, the good news, the gospel. That's what that means. He says, but if the son, therefore, shall what? Set you free. There's a metaphor. Free. He's, he's using jail and freedom as metaphors. He says, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, we don't always feel like it, right? For example, if a person is addicted to pornography and they've done a great job at abstaining for the last 15 months, and then suddenly they have a relapse, they're like, oh, when can I escape this? That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a status. Just because the Lord set us free from the curse of sin so that now we are in Christ and set at liberty doesn't mean we're never going to sin again. That's not what it's about. He's saying in his eyes, he sees you as free. 
You're his children. That'll never cease to be. You're a child of God forever. Or as the song says, you know, who am I? Remember that? Who am I? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am, right? I don't feel like a child of God all the time. Praise God, my relationship with Jesus is not based upon my feelings. Praise God. I don't always feel forgiven, but I'm forgiven. I don't always feel righteous in his eyes, but he says you're righteous because that's what my blood did to you. It, What's that? So that's why my parents could give me swine for Easter and Christmas because Jesus said it's okay, it's not a sin no more. Right, <laughs> right. Sh sh that's right, Schwein. <laughs> sh that, 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 that's a bad word in German. Sh if, if you're really mad at someone, you call him a what? A Schweinhund, a pig dog. <laughs> that's a good one. Austin, you Schweinhund. Clean up your room. No, just kidding. <laughs> so you're not under law, but under what? Grace. Hallelujah. What does grace mean? Undeserved merit. That's right. Undeserved favor. Undeserved. We didn't deserve it. Did anyone deserve God's love? Did anyone deserve for Jesus to die for them? No. That's why it's undeserved. You remember the Greek word for it? What is it again? Charis. Remember? I'm going to say it over and over. You're going to get sick of it because I want you to know the word. It's only two syllables, people. Come on. Y'all can say anti-disestablishmentarianism, right? <laughs> Charis. Say it with me. Charis. It's spelled C-H-A-R-I-S. It's where we get the word charity. Charis. Grace. When you give to someone a charity, they didn't earn it. You just give to them. Free. When someone gives to the church, we don't earn it. When someone gives, you know, for the sound system or stretch, puts up that projector, the church didn't earn that. He charitably, graciously gave us that projector. You see? Charis. For by charis, charity, grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you have been saved through faith. What a wonderful thing. All right. Colossians 2. To ram it home, we are not under law. We are not under the Old Testament, the Mosaic law. We are under this law of grace. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's what John 1 says. So Colossians 2, 3 through 15. <clears throat> and when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, okay? More metaphor. We were dead. That's how we were. Dead means guilty before God. That's all it means. Okay? Uh, Romans chapter 3 says that every mouth may be stopped. Right? It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, the Old Testament law, Moses. It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. What the law does is it tells us you're a sinner and you need Jesus. That's all. That's all. It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And it says... That every mouth may be stopped. We don't have an answer. We, ha we can't justify ourselves. We can't say, but God, oh, no. God says, no, you sinned. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. But then he says this, for all have sinned and come short of God's glory. None of us could make it. But no one reads the next verse, which is so beautiful. Being declared innocent by his grace through Christ redeeming us. Romans 3, 23 and 24. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, you guys. I mean, that's what, again, as I've said so many times, that's what gives me the strength to get out of bed. Now, old age kind of hinders that. But, but seriously... That's what allows me, that causes me to, to wake up in the morning, to make it through a day, because there's not a day that goes by that I don't disobey God. Not one day. God isn't looking down and saying, well, but you're, but you're not disobeying as bad as, no, I am. It's just as bad. What does Paul say? For there is no difference, he said. 
for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but now we're justified freely, okay? So we were dead in trespasses, uncircumcision of our flesh. God made you alive in Christ Jesus together with him. How? When he forgave us all our trespasses. And I ask this question all the time to people. Aren't you glad it didn't say some? He forgave you all your trespasses. I don't care what it is. He forgave you all of your past trespasses, all of the trespasses you committed today, and all the trespasses you're going to commit until the end comes, right? He's already forgiven you. And you say, well, good, well, I can go out and do whatever. That's actually not our response. Our response is, Lord, I know I'm going to blow it. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. No one ever gave you a wonderful handout or shelter or clothing where you said, bam, and slap them in the face. You never did that. Why? Because you're grateful. Well, if you've truly experienced God's forgiveness, past, present, and future, you're like, wow, you made me your child. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not better than anybody else, nor will I ever be. I'm just forgiven. And I just want to say thank you and love you and love others just the same way you've loved me. Does everybody follow? Mm -hmm. Very, very important. That's the good news, okay? Erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. I have a friend right now. Again, another friend who's in recovery. He's having to go through a community service program for two and a half years. Why? Because the record is still held against him. It's still held against him. And he has to perform and work and work and work and it's miserable. And I'm a sponsor. And we talk about it. And I send this off, you know, to the person who's this, you know, requires him to go through this community service. And I just feel the anguish in him. God is not like that. God doesn't say, okay, now you got to work really hard. I died for all your sins, but now you got to work really hard to forgive them. No. God is not like that. He says, my ways aren't your ways. But the Bible says he erased the record that stood, what's the phrase? Against us. Keep that. That's the main word you're going to hear, phrase you're going to hear tonight. Against us. The Mosaic Law. It was contrary, it says, with its legal demands. It was a legal issue. We sinned. We violated God's holiness. And then Jesus says, I love you so much. I've never sinned. I'm going to take your guilt and the punishment you deserve, and I'm going to put it on myself. That's what happened on the cross. That's the gospel. Don't let anyone else tell you differently. The good news is that Jesus saved us. We did not earn it. We could not earn it. He set this aside, what? Nailing it to the cross. All of our trespasses, nailing it to the cross. The record that stood against us, Nailing it to the cross. It's legal demands. Nailing it to the cross. Can I get an amen? That's super exciting for me. It's super exciting. It's why I do what I do. Seriously. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example, triumphing over them in it. Jesus won the battle. He won it. He's already victorious. That's why he says, thanks be to God who says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Okay? All right, there it is. Up, upper left-hand corner, did heaven and earth pass away? Okay, that's the big question. 
Okay. But if, if we were just to stop the study tonight, go away with what we just talked about. Okay. But now we're going to learn a little bit about metaphor. How did the Israelites see all that? Right. How did the Israelites understand the law? When the law was given, according to Hebrews, when God was giving it to Moses, remember the Ten Commandments? Uh, remember the movie, right? <laughs> Charlton Heston, I think. Was it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He gives, gives the Ten Commandments. The Bible says Moses exceedingly trembled and quaked. And the people said, don't give us any more of these laws. We can't obey it. They're scared to death because the, God was giving these laws and saying, look, here it is. Here's my standard. He says, you shall not covet. Busted. (laughs) Right? And Jesus makes it that much harder when he says, you have heard it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman just to lust after her has committed adultery in his heart or her heart. Right? It's not male exclusive, by the way, girls. (laughs) It goes both ways. In his heart. That puts everyone on the same level at the bottom of the barrel, unable to get out. That's why Jesus was saying to those Pharisees who thought they could obey the law perfectly, he's saying it's your heart. It's the problem. That's what God looks at. If you think it's about your actions, you got another thing coming. Erasing the record that stood, here it is, the phrase, against us with its legal demands. There it is. All right. Revelation 21, there it is. Saw new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away and there was no mercy. It would seem appropriate in light of the above passage to find another passage that would seem to pinpoint the timing of this passing of heaven and earth. How do we interpret, are you ready? Matthew 5, 17 and 18, if we believe the old covenant has passed away. Okay. Now here's the question. Are we under law or under grace? If we look at the Bible in the New Testament, we're under grace. Okay? Now watch this. Watch what Jesus says. What is the heaven and earth? Watch what Jesus says here. And think about the implications of what Jesus said if heaven and earth here is literal. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. In other words, we couldn't fulfill it. He did. Okay? For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's very problematic. If he's talking about the physical heaven and physical earth, sun, moon, stars, planet earth, terra firma, then we're still under the law. Okay? So just take a look at that. Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle of the law shall pass away until everything is fulfilled. Okay? So let's keep going. Consider how the law is described here and its implications upon those underneath its curse. Right? Galatians says Christ became a curse for us. They were cursed under the Old Testament, the law of Moses. And then Christ dies and removes the curse, becoming a curse in place of us, Galatians 3. But Deuteronomy says, And it shall be, if you do not at all forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify what? Against you. God is speaking. I testify against you this day that you will surely perish. The command of not worshiping other gods, oh my goodness, we worship other gods every day, folks. Mm -hmm. Every day. We do it every day. That's why we need the cross. You see what I mean? It was a command that God would use against them. Again, this same idolatry is mentioned with similar language. Watch this, Deuteronomy 31. (laughs) I will surely hide my face under the Old Testament. That's what happened. God's face was hidden. He wouldn't look upon them. He wouldn't shine on them, smile upon them. Why? It was repulsive under the Old Testament. They were sinners separated from him. 
I will surely hide my face in the day for all the evils which they have wrought, which just means worked, in that they are turned to other gods. Now, therefore, write this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. It's a witness against them. What happens when someone goes to court? They call in what? Witnesses. Witnesses. They call them to the witness stand. And so what happens under the Old Testament is God goes to the witness stand under the Old Testament and says, guilty. The law goes to the witness stand and says, guilty. The conscience goes to the witness stand and says, guilty. Deuteronomy 31, it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles have befallen them that this song will testify against them as a witness. It shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed for I know their imagination, that's all of us, and how they go about even now before I've brought them into the land which I promised. With even more clarity, this is me, we see this witness against them. Deuteronomy 31, 26, take this book of the law, watch, it gets better, trust me, we're gonna get through this, and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, right? That's what was in the, the, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant. It was, and it wasn't just in the temple. Where was it? Well, the, where was the Ark, though? It was behind the veil. Remember we talked about the veil? In this place called the what? Holy, Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark was, and that's where the presence of God was. So the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. But does everybody remember? We talked about it. What was on top of the Ark? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. James, the law, the book of James says, the law makes judgment. There's judgment there. But he says mercy triumphs over judgment. We just talked about triumph, right? Christ was victorious. He triumphed over the judgment that was against us. He conquered it. And so in the Old Testament, God places this mercy seat as something that would point forward. And Jesus, in Romans 3.25, is called the mercy seat. Isn't that beautiful? The judgment that was against us, he conquered. And he's brought us into the holy place, into God's presence where he dwells in us. Take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God. Watch, the law, Old Testament, that it may be there for a what? Witness against you, okay? It was the law that was a witness against the Israelites. It was a witness against them. It was the evidence. It was the proof. They could not escape this witness regardless of their efforts. When you're in the courtroom and, and, and you have this judge and these witnesses coming in and they're all declaring you guilty, you got these guards ready to cuff you and to put you in prison. And Jesus calls that slavery to sin. They could not escape this witness regardless of their efforts. It showed them guilty before whom? God. It was his witness against them. Specifically, the command to abstain from idolatry was the witness against them. Why? We've all done it. We've all placed idols before God. The Israelites did it. They were just the litmus test, the proof that all of us had done it. But specifically, they were given the law. Deuteronomy 4, as he describes to the Israelites through Moses, when you shall bear children and children's children and you shall have remained long in the land, and this is just talking about what Israel would do, and shall corrupt yourselves, God knew, right? <laughs> He's just being honest. He's being honest. Y'all are going to corrupt yourselves. That's what y'all do. That's what we humans do. That's why he calls us corruptible by ourselves, thank God right? If 
by ourselves. Without Christ, we're corruptible. But when we're in Christ, when we're made his children by the blood of Jesus Christ and trusting only in him, not our good works, boom, we're no longer corruptible. You may feel corruptible, trust me. I feel corruptible, but praise the Lord for his truth. And you make a graven image or likeness of anything. Do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. I call what? I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. He's not saying, oh, the sun is a witness against you. Or the stars. Or flowers. Or trees. He is saying, your world right now, Israelites, is me and the law, the Old Testament. That's your world. You're surrounded. Underneath, you're surrounded. On top, you're surrounded. It's all a witness against you. Guilty. The verdict is out. Guilty. You're under the curse. Now that's so depressing. So let's go home. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to leave you hanging, right? I'm not going to leave you hanging like that. I call heaven and earth to witness against you that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land where you go over Jordan to possess it. He's saying once you get into your promised land, you're going to perish because all you do is disobey me. That's all we do, folks. The Bible says if we transgress one of the commandments, what? You've transgressed them all, James 2.10. You break one of them, he says you've broken them all, that's it. That's how holy God is. That's what the Old Testament was designed to do, is to show us we can't do it, I can't obey it. It was never designed so that we could claw our way to heaven. That's what false religion teaches you. That's what, I should say, religion teaches you. Relationship teaches you this. We couldn't claw our way to heaven. Jesus came down, brought heaven to us through the cross. He did what we could not do. That's the gospel. That's the good news. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. Gosh, that's dismal. What a drag. Aren't you glad you weren't born under the old covenant? Yeah. Notice the witness against them, heaven and earth. The law was their heaven and earth. It was their world and surroundings. The passage says that heaven and earth would be there as a witness against them, that you shall soon utterly perish. This reminds us of a previous passage, Deuteronomy 8, not verse 19. It shall be, if you do at all, gosh, that's scary. Watch what he says. If you do at all, forget the Lord your God. Anyone ever forgotten the Lord? I have. Every day. Every day. In fact, I'm going to start a one or two part series called How to Live as an Atheist. <laughs> I know that sounds strange, huh? Sounds strange. We forget the Lord every day. I have forgotten him countless times today. It's been a rough day, <laughs> right? And usually when it's a rough day, we forget him and we get caught up in our circumstances and all the things that are just causing us stress and angst and ugh, all that garbage. And next thing you know, we're not thinking about God. We're thinking about self. How can I protect myself? How can I defend myself? Instead of, Lord, you've got this. <laughs> you know, people come up to me, George, you got this. Uh, actually, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Never did and never will. Jesus has it. Jesus, you got this. And I know it's okay. To, I'm not saying, you know, have your kid, he's playing basketball. Go, little Jimmy, you got this. I'm not trying to be legalistic about it. But you might want to say, Jimmy, you got this because Jesus has got you. <laughs> so now, if you don't hit it out of the park, <laughs> when you get home, you're, no. All right, here we go. <laughs> Austin's like, yeah. <laughs> he never played baseball. Anyway, <clears throat> 
that you shall soon utterly perish. Deuteronomy 18, it shall be if you do all forget the Lord your God, walk after other gods, serve them, worship them. I testify, there goes God again, against you this day that you shall utterly perish. How did God testify against them? With the heaven and earth of the law, Deuteronomy 30. I call heaven and earth to, and I italicized it on purpose, to record this day against you. The heaven and earth is the law. It represents the law. It's writing it down. They've got a record. And you know, it's a terrible thing, but if you're a felon, if you're a felon, it's very hard to get that expunged, right? It's always there. It's always there. It's written down. And it plagues you for the rest of your life. You go to try and get jobs. Oh, she's a felon. Sorry, we found another candidate that's more qualified for the job. See that? So God is saying, I'm calling to the Old Testament. It's a record against you. It's in your file. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. What records against them? What witnesses against them? Certainly not the physical heavens and earth, but rather the law. Colossians, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Handwriting, the record, the witness, which was contrary to us. We couldn't do it. Because you might be saying to yourself, well, now that I'm a Christian, I can obey it perfectly. What are you going to do about the past? Nothing can erase the past. Nothing that we do can erase the past. Colossians 2.14, Christ blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Can you imagine, wouldn't that be cool if you were a felon? No, I'm, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the sentence. Come on. But wouldn't that be cool if you were a felon, you had someone in high places and they went in there and blotted it out? <laughs> right? Everybody's going, yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. Then I get a job, you know? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way nailing it to his cross. Don't visualize that without Jesus on that cross. The spotless Lamb of God with no sin, no blemish, perfect in thought and action, took every single one of our sins and said, I am becoming guilty taking your guilt upon me so that you can be set free and be righteous as I am. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, that is some freaking good news. Amen. Freaking freak is a metaphor, by the way. Freak, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway. Through the law, all of their transgressions were recorded against them. Finally, the most convincing passage of all includes everything we have just mentioned. I think we're going to get through this. Deuteronomy 31, 26. <laughs> Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God that it, the law, may be there for a witness against you. For I know your rebellion. God's not pulling any punches under the Old Testament. He's saying, I know y'all are rebels. What's that song? Uh, Rebel Without a Cause. No, that's a movie, isn't it? Is that James Dean? So. Who is that? Yeah, Rebel Without a Cause. That's all of us. We're rebels. We're rebellious. That's our nature. I know your rebellion, your stiff neck. Behold, while I'm yet alive with you this day, I've been, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death gather to me all the elders of your tribes, all your officers, that I may speak these words, the law, in their ears and call heaven and earth to record witness against them. 
Does everybody see it now? That heaven and earth is the law. That was the witness. That was the old covenant, the old creation. It was a witness against them. And this should bring to mind Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 13, 10 through 13, chapter 8, verse 10 through 13. And this is a prophecy that is from Jeremiah 31, okay? For this is the covenant that I will make with them. There's the old covenant, but now this is the new covenant. What did Jesus say? This is the what? The new covenant in my what? Blood, Lisa. The new covenant is in his blood. You see, sin demands death under the old covenant, right? What does it say in Romans 6, 23? For the wages of what? Sin is what? Death. But the gift of of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, blood, his blood. Blood represents death. And that's why Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no what? Forgiveness of sins. I'll put my laws in their mind. I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. Remember Revelation? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First heaven, first earth, and path away, and there was no more sea. I just did a list there. That was pretty cool. And then he says this. I will be their God. I will walk among them and dwell with them. And they shall be my people. That's what Jeremiah says. And that's what Hebrews is quoting from Jeremiah. And they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Why? How? For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Man, think about that the next time you're holding a grudge. Amen? Think about it. Think about anyone you have a grudge against right now. That is absolutely like my biggest struggles, like, you know, I, I tell people, you know, I, I'm in recovery for alcoholism. I'm in recovery for drug addiction. Absolutely. If you think those are my worst problems, no, my worst problems that I have to go to Jesus every day for grudges and gossip, the evil G's. <laughs> grudges and gossip and every time I kid you not every time I go to him and thank him that he doesn't hold a grudge grudge against me and that he doesn't gossip against me <clears throat> it really diffuses my spirit of judgment first of all I have no right second of all it's like who am I if the holy spotless lamb of God doesn't judge me or gossip about me who am I to hold a grudge against Charlene or Carol or Rick or gossip about them. Who am I? You see, that's what love produces. Or I should say love reduces the grudge. Love reduces the gossip because you're thinking about his love for you. That's why I constantly say, don't buy into this weird idea that, that the UMC and so many other denominations are going through where, well, let's not talk about Jesus. Let's just do our social stuff. No, you, you, we have to talk about Jesus first. If I'm going to love like Jesus, I need to know how Jesus loved. Everybody follow? I mean, that's what the whole thing is for this year at the annual conference, right? Following Jesus, thriving in community, and healing the world. Well, holy cow, again, how do you follow Jesus unless you know how Jesus loved? He loved us so much that he died for us and he doesn't hold a grudge. And he says, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness. Their sins and their iniquities I will never remember. Think about that. Who's that person? that you have a grudge against. If God doesn't remember your sins, who are we? In that he says a new covenant. He's made the first old. And this is right before the destruction of the temple, by the way. He says, now that which is decaying and waxing old, 
talking about the temple, is about to vanish away. We see that the old covenant that was decaying, and it was in the present tense, it was in the present tense because it was still standing. The Romans hadn't destroyed it yet in AD 70. We see that the old covenant was decaying, present tense, and waxing old, present tense, was ready to vanish away with the destruction of their temple, the centerpiece, the physical temple of the Jewish old covenant system. The old covenant had completely waxed old and vanished away. The heaven and earth had passed away. This would explain Isaiah 51, a passage that compares the temporal quality of the law versus the eternal quality of new covenant salvation. Lift up your eyes. It's a prophecy of what Jesus would do on the cross. Isaiah 51, verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish like smoke. The earth shall wax old, right? Like a garment, garment, old covenant garment, gross, uh, torn, moth-eaten garments. They're called that in James, moth-eaten garments. But we have the garments of what? Salvation. Psalm 132, the robes of righteousness. They shall wax old like a garment. They that dwell therein, in that old covenant system and are trusting in their works, he says, they die in like manner. But my salvation, Jesus dying on the cross, the new covenant shall be forever. Can I get an amen? (laughs) And my righteousness shall not be abolished. He died for you, took took your sin upon himself and gave you his righteousness. That's what it says. He made him who knew no sin, Christ, to become sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God. I ended just on time, and that is heavenly. (laughs) Metaphor, by the way. (laughs) 